Good morning, everybody. Uh, if you're new around here, my name is Dan, and I'm new around here too, so we're in this together. Uh, if you have a Bible, you can turn to Mark chapter 1. We are continuing a series that we just started last week uh, that we are calling, call, calling Discovering Jesus. And uh, so we're working through the gospel of Mark, uh, passage by passage, and we're just asking the simple question that people have been asking for a couple thousand years. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus of Nazareth? Who is he really? And what difference does it make? And what if he really is who he said he was? How would that change the way we live our life? Even for those of us that profess a faith in Christ, if we really believe that Jesus is who he said he was, or who Mark claims that he was, it would change everything about how we live our lives and the confidence that we would have going through the unknowns of life. And, you know, you can learn so much uh, about someone by just observing them, just being a bystander, looking at them, seeing the way uh, they act, just watching and observing somebody. And Mark's account that we are looking at about Jesus just kind of puts him up on a platter for us to just look at, to observe, and to come to a conclusion about who he is. And it's believed that Mark's account was the first written account about the life of Jesus. And so uh, the stories about his life had been passed down orally in an oral culture, but as the eyewitnesses were starting to die off, it became necessary for a written account of Jesus' life uh, to be composed. And so Mark will give us statements about who Jesus is, like we looked at last week, uh, but then he will just kind of let us observe him. There's maybe less teaching uh, from Jesus in, in Mark compared to some other of the other gospel accounts, but we just get to see what he was like, how he lived, not just in word, but also in action. Last week we saw that Jesus is what Mark would say called the Christ, the Messiah, and that he was the Son of of God. And this week we begin to see uh, more clearly who this Jesus of Nazareth is and what he came to do. So we'll pick up again in verse 9 of Mark chapter 1. Mark writes this, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. As soon as he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Verse 12, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels were serving him. We'll look, we, uh, last week we looked, in the passage, we looked at nine and 11, verses 9 through 11 briefly, uh, but we're going to drill in a little further into them. You know, to a Jewish audience, uh, they'd be picking up right away on the parallels between Mark's account and a lot of the Old Testament that they were so very familiar with. If you look at Isaiah, so Isaiah 64.1 says this, If only you would tear the heavens open and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. And Mark says he saw the heavens being what? Torn open. And then Isaiah 42 says this, this is my servant, I strengthen him. This is my chosen one, I delight in him. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. And Mark's account says, and the spirit descended on him like a dove. So Mark is purposefully uh, tethering Jesus of Nazareth back to the Old Testament in the anticipation of this coming Messiah. And not just Isaiah, but even the very beginning, the Genesis account. You know, Mark says that the Spirit descended on him like a dove. Okay, so what? What's the big deal about that imagery? Well, Jews, again, would have picked up on this immediately. There's so much that we just kind of like read over, you know, like, oh, that's a cute metaphor. Uh, but what's the big deal? They, we looked at these similarities between Mark and Isaiah, but the only other place where this imagery of something being like a dove was used was actually in Genesis chapter 1, which says the Spirit hovered over the face of the waters. And the Hebrew verb mean, there means to flutter. 
okay? And so in the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament, which is called the Targum, uh, which most, so most people in first century Galilee would have spoken Aramaic. And so, for example, in Mark's account, even you see Jesus speak it in Mark 15 when he dies on the cross. He says, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which is Aramaic, for my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Okay, all that to say, they would have been so familiar with this Aramaic translation of the Old Testament. And that read, uh, in, in Genesis, it read like this. And the earth was with, without form and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, quote, fluttered above the face of the waters like a dove. And God spoke, let there be light. Okay, you may not have thought you were coming to church for a language lesson, so why does that matter? Why is this important? This is echoing, this account of Jesus coming is echoing the Trinity's work at the, the very first creation, the Genesis account. And so here we see the Son is baptized, the Spirit descends on him, and the Father gives his approval. You are my Son in whom I am well pleased. So Mark, again, is deliberately pointing them and pointing us back to the creation account, saying that this, is a, this renewal of the earth, this work of Jesus, is a creation of the, new, of the triune God. Tim Keller says it like this. He says, just as the original creation of the world was a project of the triune God, Mark says, so the redemption of the world the rescue and renewal of all things that is beginning now with the arrival of the king is also a project of the triune God. So Mark is painting Jesus' coming as a renewal, a recreation of the, wor- of the world, a redemptive renewal of all things, and that it's a work of the whole trinity. So why does that matter? You know, you may think the Trinity is some like ivory tower doctrine that you kind of just stuff away for debates or something like that. But it's extremely relevant, important, and actually really practical for us as Christians. You know, 1 John will go on to say that God is love. Not that God has love or that he, you know, feels love sometimes or that it kind of comes and goes, but that he is love. And the reason God is love or can be love is because God is Trinity. God is community. John says it like this in John 17. I think this is one of the most important verses in all the Bible. He says, says Jesus is praying and he says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am so that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. Jesus said to the Father, you loved me before the world was even created. So the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit have been experiencing the self-giving, other-glorifying love before time as we know it. And if God wasn't Trinity, there would have been a time when he wasn't loving because there was nobody to love. And then he would have created us in order to have somebody to love. And that would mean that God is dependent on us to be who he is. And like that he created us out of need. Imagine a parent, you know, or a couple parents that they were just so lonely and needy that they decided to have a kid. Not to actually love the kid, but to fill themselves up. To try to fill a hole in their own life. They would crush that kid with their expectations. They would have to, uh, they, they would have had a child to try and sort of like fix themselves, not to unconditionally love them, but so that the the kid could try to fill some sort of hole in the parent's life. But because God is Trinity, we know that God created us not because he needed us, and that's actually really good news, but because of the overflowing love that he has been experiencing for eternity, That, that they were experiencing this communal Uh, self-giving love and that it would brim over and that's how creation came about. And so Mark is tying this renewal of the earth, this coming of the Messiah back to that original creation. 
back to this Trinitarian overflowing love for creation. And so Jesus' rescue mission wasn't out of neediness, but out of self-giving love that he has experienced since before the world was even created. Point being, we see who Jesus is. We saw last week he is the, the Christ, the Messiah. He is the Son of God. But now we see as part of this other glorifying, self-giving community known as the Trinity. So that's who he is. Next, let's look at what he does. Verse 12 picks up and says, Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels were serving him. So not only does this passage echo back to the creation account, which it does, but here it points back to the original fall in Genesis chapter 3. So Jesus' time in the wilderness echoes the temptation in the garden where Adam and Eve sinned and fractured the whole creation. So Mark is intentionally tethering or drawing these parallels between the life of Christ and the creation account and the account of when sin entered the world. So not only has he come to renew the world, but to also overcome the one that we could not. So immediately the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. And the word for drive there is ekbalo, which can be translated expel or drive out or even cast out. Jesus will use that, uh, or Mark will use that same word to describe Jesus casting out demons. And, but I think the point that Mark is trying to do here is, again, to link it back to Genesis 3, when mankind chose sin over God. And so uh, Genesis 3.24 says this, He drove the man out and stationed the cherubim in the flaming whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Okay, so the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, right? But then it was uh, translated into Greek. And so the Greek word used here for drove is the same that's used for the spirit driving or ekbalo Jesus into the wilderness. So again, you don't need to know all that, but the point is, why would Mark do this? He is hinting at this idea of Jesus being this new Adam, this new representation of humanity. And Paul will pick up on this idea in Romans. For example, he'll say in Romans 5, if by one man's trespass, Adam, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Paul will use this language to picture, uh, to, to paint Jesus as this new Adam, or, or a second Adam, who came to make all things right. Where Adam and Eve took the fruit, Jesus fasted. Where they took the bait, Jesus remained strong against the enemy's schemes. So he, he came to conquer the evil one that mankind fell uh, succumb to. Where God's promises in Genesis 3, he, he promised that one would come to, quote, crush the head of the serpent. And so just as Adam and Eve were tempted to deny a life that orbited around this loving triune God, Satan tempts Jesus to make life about him too. He'll say things like, I'll, I'll give you all these things, Jesus, if you fall down and worship me. But Jesus does not take the bait. So Jesus comes on the scene to succeed where mankind failed and to live the life that we simply could not. That we simply could not. I don't know if you noticed in the passage, but what's with the wild animals? You know, he says like he was with the wild animals uh, and the angels were serving him. Why would Mark, Mark add that? Was Jesus like a hunter or something? You know, what is that about? And Mark is actually the only gospel account that includes this. All the rest don't. Why? It's, it's very interesting. Uh, sometimes these like throwaway lines, you know, uh, can lead you down some pretty fun rabbit holes. So, Mark, when, but when Mark was writing, it was common for Christians to be thrown to uh, wild animals at this time. So it's a way of Jesus identifying with those Christians. Nero, who we talked about last week a little bit, he would actually take Christians and sew uh, the skins of wild animals on them and then throw them to the beasts. 
So Jesus is identifying himself with mankind, not to only overcome Satan, but to overcome evil itself and the evils that were being done against his people at that time. Jesus came to live the life that we simply could not. Jesus came to overcome the temptation that we always fall to. Where we always take the bait. You know, it's easy to point at Adam and Eve and be like, come on, guys, you ruined it for the rest of us. But we all take the bait, or we all take the fruit, rather. We all exchange the truths of God for the lies of the enemy. We've all done things we regret, that we deeply regret, that have caused collateral damage in our lives and in our relationships. I've got a trail full of things that I wish I could go back and change. Why do we, why, why did Adam and Eve, why do we still fall for it? Like we can know all these things are true. We can even know about, we can even be taught about the devil and Satan. We can know about the love of this beautiful, triune, self-giving God, but yet we still fall for the enemy's ways. Why? Why? I mean, it seems like a bad bargain, but yet we are chained to it. I think our main problem is, is that we believe God is holding out on us, so we choose other things over him. Same as Adam and Eve. We think God is holding out on us. We don't really believe he's actually good towards us. That he would actually want the best for us. That he would actually care about our our desires and our well-being and our joy. If you look at the original temptation, that's exactly what happened. Genesis 3 says this, He said to the woman, so this is the serpent, He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The answer should have been no. That's actually not what he said at all. Look at what he did say in Genesis 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. So God has offered every tree in the garden except for one. And Satan twists that and says, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? God had been so generous to Adam and Eve. And there's just this one thing that they thought they could not live without. Just this, this one thing that the enemy would whisper in their, in their mind, isn't God holding out on you? We are so defeated by temptation, not because we're trying to take God's grace for granted, because, but because we actually have a hard time actually accepting God's grace for us, accepting his generosity towards us. They took the bait because they thought God was holding out on them. We choose temptation when we think God is holding out on us. And, and we go to that thing because we think it's going to lead to life. We don't really believe that Jesus came to give us life abundant. Like he must define abundant a different way that's miserable. But for us that have kids, like don't we want this so bad for our kids? Like, buddy, I just want you to trust me. Like, let me surprise you with something good. But sometimes they just can't handle it. They need to know, you know? They like think I'm not going to come through or whatever. Like, let me just surprise you with something good. You don't have to try to control it. Trust that your dad wants the best for you. And we think God is holding out on us, but he wouldn't even withhold his own son for our sake from coming and dying for us while we were still sinners. And you think God's holding out on you? We take this bait of temptation when we think God is holding out on us, but Jesus did not come to take but to give. This triune God who has always existed in this perfect relationship of self-giving, other-glorifying love invites us into that relationship to experience that. John will say in John 17, I made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that the love, this is Jesus praying, so that the love you have loved me uh, with may be in them. 
and I may be in them. Did you catch that? Have you ever meditated on that? If this is true, there is nothing that compares to that offer. If this is true. He's saying the love that you, the Father, have have loved me with, I want them to experience that. This perfect love. Not this love that takes. This perfect love. Michael Reeves says it this way. There's this great little book called Delighting in the Trinity. It's, It's just a short, accessible read. It is so fantastic. He expounds on this whole idea. And he says this, That, indeed, is why the Father sent him that we who have rejected him might be brought back and brought back not merely as creatures, but as children to enjoy the abounding love the Son has always known. Is that what you think of when you think of Christianity? Like, do you realize the bargain you are receiving Is this what people outside of these walls think about when they think about us Christians? When they think about church, when they think about Jesus, when they think about Christianity? Is that what they think of? Is that what we portray to the world around us? The the self-giving, perfect love. That is the heart of Christianity. That is the heart of why Jesus came. To bring us back as children to Uh, enjoy that abounding love that he has always known. It's like if you have a really good restaurant and you're like, I I got it, okay, I ate it, it was delicious, now I got to go bring my friends, get get my friends and bring them over here to experience this. You know, McDonald's or whatever. Just kidding. Uh, 1889, I mean, who's going to pay so much money to go there? That's just absurd. But I'm sure it's really good. But it's like taking, wanting somebody else to experience what you have always experienced. Have you ever had that happen? Or like you go up to, you have some experience of vacation or go up to Glacier or something like, oh, I wish so-and-so was here. That's the heart of what is happening in this passage. Jesus is saying that he has always experienced this perfect, selfless love between the Father, Son, and Spirit and that he came to earth. He left that throne. Why? So that the love you have loved me with may be in them. That's the offer. Does that do anything for you? Do you realize that? That the God of the universe, of the cosmos, created us and wrote himself into the story and now of the renewal of creation to bring us this perfect love. If this is true, how can we not surrender everything to him? Like, how can we not want to choose him over anything else in this world? Like, you're telling me your little hobby sin or whatever is more fulfilling than that? No way. That's the offer of Christianity. I think if we could just grasp that, we would never choose a little fleeting pleasure here over that. A little temptation there. The offer of Christianity is so much better than anything the enemy will ever offer us. Jesus came to invite us into that love that he has experienced for eternity. What else satisfies like that? Like if we could see reality for for what it really was, if we could kind of take our little sin spectacles or whatever off, we would see that choosing sin over choosing this overflowing love of God is like taking a handful of gold and exchanging it for a handful of garbage. C.S. Lewis put it so well when he said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We are far too easily pleased. Our problem isn't or our problem is we don't really believe God is good and loving and generous towards us. We think he's holding out on us. We think he's out to get us. Like as soon as we start having fun, we're like, oh no, God's going to take it away. But if God really is Trinity and always has been loving one another, then we can trust that his work in our life is for our good. Because it is the 
It is the overflow of that perfect love that he has enjoyed for all eternity. He didn't create us because he needed us. Nothing else satisfies like that. There's a quote by Julian of Norwich, who was a Christian writer from the Middle Ages, and she said, anything less than God ever me wanteth, or anything less than God leaves me wanting more. When I first read that quote, it hit me just like a ton of bricks. It was simultaneously crushing, yet blooming with hope, because all of a sudden it seemed so clear. I don't know about you, but for me, the last few decades have been searching and coming up empty. But suddenly I understood why. I've spent my life tirelessly looking for it, you know? For that thing, that something, but it's so elusive. As soon as you think you have it, you grasp it, it slips through your fingers. It's like trying to contain a handful of fog or smoke. But yet I just kept going, kept searching kept seeking, sure, I would finally get it. You know, it drives you to make decisions, to make moves, to seek careers, to buy things, to plan trips. If you're like me, then you plan more trips while you're on trips, uh, or you lay awake at night dreaming of what could be or mourn what was. And what is the it that we're all seeking? We're seeking satisfaction. We're seeking fulfillment. We're seeking joy. But rather than trying to find it in God, we look for it in the gifts of God. Julian would go on to ask, she said, why aren't Christians the happiest, the most easeful people in all the wide world? Her answer was, because we seek to have our rest in things that are so little. Jesus overcame the enemy where Adam and Eve failed because Jesus wasn't seeking satisfaction in something little. He had tasted the love of God and knew that nothing else even compared. Nothing else comes close, and now he comes to offer us that same love. Lewis would say in another way, he said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Where do you go to find satisfaction? Where do you go to find satisfaction? Are you looking for it in something less than God? And I'm not saying we need to forsake all good things. No, I'm just saying we can receive those things from God as a gift from God or a means to God. Are we enticed by the things of the world because we have no acquired taste for God? The point is this, if all this is true, that the triune God came to offer us a spot in this dance of self-giving love, then we are foolish to think anything else can satisfy the human soul. Jesus came, was baptized, sent to the wilderness to overcome the enemy so that he could offer us this. So he could bring us back, not as creatures, but as children to taste this overflowing, beautiful, self-giving love. Now, how do we really overcome temptation when it comes? Like This is all good in, in theory, but when the time comes, when the thing is held out, the fruit is held out, how do we overcome that enticement? Short answer, I don't know. But Jesus came to overcome the temptation that we could not, to live the life that we could not. My working theory is this, and I I really believe this now, that it's more than just willpower. It's more than just, you know, grit your teeth. That works for some stuff. But I think deep down, the only way we can really overcome temptation is to truly believe that God is better. Hebrews will talk about, actually, Hebrews will be really honest, it'll talk about the fleeting pleasures of sin. Saying, hey, there's pleasure there, but it's fleeting. But to say, I don't want fleeting pleasure, I want lasting, eternal pleasure. And eventually, where we can get to a place where you look at the, the tempting fruit, and you look at God, and you don't fall for those schemes anymore because you've been down this road too many times. You know how it's going to end. What if you actually believe 
that God loved you and wanted to invite you into that love, into the same love that they have experienced since the beginning of time. Maybe getting your soul to actually believe he loves you is the knife to sever the tether to your sin. And as you choose God, because even when you don't fully understand, you trust that he is leading you to life, to green, pra- green pastures, to, to bread. He's not here to take. He's here to give. And he understands. Hebrews says in Hebrews 4, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. That we can go boldly to him when we are tempted, when we come up short. To find what? A stern lecture? No. To receive mercy and grace and help. A.W. Tozer said that the man who has struggled to purify himself and has had nothing but repeated failures will experience real relief when he stops tinkering with his soul and looks away to the perfect one. It's getting your eyes off of yourself and onto him, onto that Trinitarian beautiful love that he's inviting us into. Not tinkering with your own soul, trying to fix it on your own, but opening up those dark places, those shameful places, those things you're still ashamed of to experience the transforming love and grace of God. In this passage of Mark, we see that Jesus does and always lived in community. And because of that, he died for us, not because he needs us, but because he wants us to experience the overflow of that divine love. And he overcame the temptation that we could not. He came and lived a life we could not. And when we see the beautiful reality, that beautiful reality for what it is, we can trust and choose that his way indeed leads to life, to true, lasting, and abundant life. Would you pray with me as we close? Father, we just come before you and we just repent for our disbelief. Oh, there's so many times in my life when I think you're holding out on me. And I know that's true for so many of us, Father. I pray that we would see reality for what it really is, that you came to give, to give your son. Jesus, you came to give your life as a ransom so that we could be brought back, not as creatures, but as children whom you love so dearly. Father, help us to believe that and that we can trust that you're leading us to life and the offer of your gospel is better than anything else the world or the enemy can offer us. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.